Hello, I'm John Hager with Activism is Medicine, and this is another of our roundtable discussions. We're fortunate today to be able to talk with Rick Moody, who's a visionary, a scholar, and an author. And he's going to talk with us about elders and the climate collapse, what we can do to work with other generations. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm John Hager, and I'm going to sort of kick off this uh, this forum today. I think we're very uh, fortunate to have with us uh, Rick Moody, who's a PhD. Uh, Rick served as the executive director of the Brookdale Center on Aging at Hunter College, chairman of the board of Elder Hostel. He was a vice president of academic affairs for AARP and on the visiting faculty of the Fielding Graduate University and to Tohoku, Tohoku University in Japan. I, I know I messed up that, uh, that word. My Japanese is no better than yours. <laughs> in 2011, Rick received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society on Aging, and in 2008 was named the UT Reader Magazine as one of 50 visionaries who are changing our world. Rick is the author of many scholarly articles. You know, to give you one example, he wrote, he helped write uh, Aging, Climate Change, and Legacy Thinking, which not only recognized climate change as a complex long-term problem, but it also examined the concept of legacy thinking among older people mm -hmm. as a strategy for elder activism. And all this was 12 years ago in 2012. He's also the author of books, uh, co-author of Aging Concepts and Controversies, now in his 10th edition. I feel like I'm getting older all the time. We should stop right here. <laughs> probably said enough. No, I, I want to say one other thing, and that is okay. that you haven't slowed down, not one bit. No, You're currently the editor of a weekly newsletter and hmm. on aging, and this one of those... Uh, the newsletter is one of the things that attracted us to uh, contacting you. So Good. welcome, Rick. We're you. really happy to have you on the forum. And uh, maybe the one way to start is uh, how did your studies with aging lead you to be a climate activist? Mm -hmm. Very simply, uh, I got older and I had grandchildren. And now I have two granddaughters. And now a third just arrived last week here in the Bay Area where I live now, the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, one of the things I do is I work with groups of young people. I'm working with a 16 year old high school, high school junior, uh, Jaden Wen. And uh, I said to him, gee, when you were born, I was 60, already 63 years old. And uh, when you're my age, it's gonna be the year 2003 or something like that. So I uh, began to see that, you know, uh, the world is going to outlast me. I'm 79 years old now. And so uh, I put two and two together. Uh, don't have to be much of a mathematician to do that. And you don't have to really know much to see what's going on about climate. Mm -hmm. So you folks are involved with Extinction Rebellion. I'm interested in holding off extinction as far as possible for my grandchildren and others. That's my story in a nutshell. What thoughts do you have about how elder activists can uh, best uh, interact with and work with young climate activists? You know, there, there is a bigger goal. We've got to listen to them and uh, maybe just do less talking and more listening. So that's a very important dimension of this. And, we're discovering that right now in the current work that we're doing with uh, uh, ac activists here in the Bay Area. Um, my general impression is that young people don't enjoy being told what to do uh, or why, uh, you, you know, you really know more than they do. So uh, this is a problem for elders, because if you actually look at the data of how uh, climate has gotten worse in the last 30 or 40 years, you realize that it's people like maybe the people on this call right now, I'm looking at some gray haired faces, uh, bald heads and so forth. 
Yeah. Um, we are responsible. And uh, that is an important admission to make, not necessarily to beat up on us. Uh, you know, guilt is the gift that keeps on giving, that sort of thing. I'm not interested in promoting climate anxiety. Uh, what I like about your organization, your group, is uh, that you follow uh, the great philosopher Joan Baez, who said that action is the antidote to anxiety. Three A's. So that's really what interests me. How do we mobilize people around action, uh, around the things that they can do? And I've just written a book on that, actually, but I try to focus on that in my newsletter, too. Same title, same message. I don't have a lot that's new to say, which is simply that uh, do the things that are within your sphere of action, what you can do. And we can talk about that. That's important. Otherwise, people feel, oh, my God, I go halt another terrible climate story. I turn off the TV, change the channel, go somewhere else, go to the beach, whatever it is. Uh, we need to focus on things that make us feel better because we're making a difference. That's my message. Mm -hmm. Frank, you have any questions? I do. Um, we had a guest on a few weeks ago, a biologist, and he had um, a pretty sobering view of the human species, you might say. Yeah. And we had a great conversation. But toward the end, we we asked him, what would you tell young people today? Yeah. And he said, he, well, he paused a little bit and then he said, don't listen to us. <laughs> don't like listen to us. And I was shocked. I was, I was really set back by that because historically speaking, elders are the ones who are supposed to know how the tribe should survive, how we should make our way in the world. That's and right. now all of a sudden, it's don't listen to us. We screwed it up so badly that now the ball is in your court. You're going to have to find your way. What's your response to that? My response is that it's partly right. And uh, part of what I said was don't listen to us, meaning we have to find new ways to speak to young people. But I don't agree with the idea that we haven't got anything to offer. One of the things that I do, uh, as as I said, I'm retired. I'm 79 years old. I used to work for AARP. Somebody said, well, how do you retire from AARP? And my answer is, just watch me. I'll show you how to do it. So my answer is, what I do in my retirement time is I help small nonprofits with fundraising and marketing. And um, I've learned a lot about that. I've had many failures uh, over my life of marketing and fundraising. And I mainly tell them what my failures have been. Here's the mistakes that I've made. Maybe you can avoid some of those mistakes too. Um, th there is a danger. I, I went to another room to get this book. Can you read it? Uh, I, the title is backwards, and uh, which I'm reading right now. Um, and I'm not against these books. Obviously, I spend my time reading them, but I worry that uh, we can immobilize people. And um, I don't want to get too far into politics, uh, but I also don't want to avoid it completely either, because um, uh, in 19, not 19, 2000, see, that shows just how old I am that I think every every date begins with 19. No, it's not true. Um, in 2017, right after Mr. Trump became inaugurated, I joined with others in Boulder, Colorado, where I lived at the time, to create our branch of Indivisible. Uh, because we felt, you know, we could be doing different, something different here. And uh, what Mr. Trump is doing in this recording is being made in 2024. Um, he's basically selling pessimism and gloom and disaster. Uh, things have never been worse. Uh, that's not quite true. In fact, that's not true at all, if you look at statistics. But we also have to look at people's lived experience and in some of their lived experience, uh, bad things happen in terms of uncertainty. And this uh, is something we have to face up to. And we have to face up to that in terms of climate as well. But we can't speak only in terms of pessimism. Uh, that's part of the picture, what you might call uh, dread, climate dread. And there's a great newsletter on that, by the way, which I, I recommend. Um, but if it's just dread and anxiety, I think we've got a very 
inadequate message. We also need hope. The question is how to avoid false hope. So we have false hope and false anxiety, and uh, we need to abo avoid both. Now, it's very easy for me to say that, but say, okay, Moody, well, how do we know what's true? And then we have to look at very specific things like uh, how much does recycling really pay off? And if it doesn't, why not? And uh, when there are solutions, people bring forward geoengineering, all sorts of things, fusion power. I think we need to be very cautious about these solutions, these so-called solutions. We can talk about this if you want to get into the details. Um, but that's why, and what I do and what I try to do in my newsletter and my book is to tell people focus on things that are closer to home where you're pretty confident about what the payoff will be. Mm -hmm. You can't always do it. Uh, for example, uh, I don't have an EV. And somebody said, well, why don't you have an EV? And I said, well, I drive very little and I keep a car for 10 or 15 years or more. Uh, and I don't want a new car of any kind. If I get a new car, I'll get an EV. Uh, but that's not for me. And somebody says, well, how come you don't have a heat pump? And the answer is, uh, I live in a multifamily housing. You're looking around right now. We're doing construction work at the moment. So I hope the noise isn't great. Um, I don't have the right to do that. I don't have the ability to do that in where I live. But as soon as my uh, uh, gas heater uh, reaches the end of its natural life, it'll be immediately replaced by a, uh, an electric heater. Now, why am I doing that? Whether I want to do it or not, doesn't make any difference whether I want to do it or not. I was one of the people here in San Mateo who lobbied our city council to put into effect a requirement. If you're going to replace your gas heater, it's going to be replaced with an electric. So some people say, well, you know, this stuff that you talk about, do what you can, small scale, individuals can't solve the problem, can they? And my answer is yes, they can't solve the problem but they need to do what is within their sphere and link up with others politically. So I said I didn't want to talk about politics, but yes, I do want to talk about politics because we need to do that. Anyway, I'm talking too much right now. And I started by saying we don't want to talk too much, but you called me to interview me. So what can I tell you? <laughs> Taylor? Well, Rick, I think it's really important to keep top of mind the politics of survival. Right, because the politics of survival. I love that phrase. I'm going to write that down. It's all yours. <laughs> the thing of it is that uh, every political decision we make has an impact, right? We understand that you pull on one thread and the whole universe comes with it. So, yep. in that regard, when we think about where we are as elders and how yep. uh, the great uh, psychologist Eric Erickson said that in our in our stage we move yep. from generativity versus stagnation and we have integrity versus despair. That's and, right. And in that, given this compelling need, what can we, how can we better inspire elders to get off our duffs and get out there and do something that makes sense? Like you said, you know, do what you can with what you have where you are, and also to be engaged in the larger, the larger process of the politics of survival. Tell the stories, as many stories as possible, and make them real stories, not fake stories. And Keep a simple message. Somebody just said, sent me a, a question today. I work with a, a guy named Art Johnson, who comes out of a long experience in broadcasting. Uh, and his main passion in life now is climate action. Uh, he happens to be a black guy. And uh, so I use him as my the guy who teaches me about black experience, African-American experience. Why do I do that? Because I once uh, was an elementary school teacher in Harlem. And uh, I was a traveling photographer. They sent me to black colleges throughout the South. And I was the only white guy in a room of a thousand black people. And I said, wait a minute, this is different from the world that I grew up in. I need to think about the world and see the world differently. So Art was saying to me, well, how do we communicate? Because he's developing a whole uh, YouTube channel on climate action. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, the answer is very simple. Keep it simple and get right to the point. That's what Trump is showing us, actually. One reason why he and other so-called populists, I say so-called because they're not really populists, because they actually deprive people of their money and their options in all kinds of ways. But they're, they, are, they do believe in simple communication. So somebody said, well, what's this book you're writing? What's it all about? 
And I said, well, it's, it's pretty simple. Here, now, you, hope. That's it. Four words. Here, now, you, hope. Mm -hmm. Climate change is already here. It's now. It's affecting you and the people you care about. Then people, oh, my God, it's worse than I thought. Yeah, that's true. There's hope. And what is hope? Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. That's what David Orr said. He's absolutely right. So we have to look for actions. You guys in your program, your, uh, how do you call it? Uh, activism is the antidote or- uh, Activism is medicine. Activism is medicine. See, I need to take a little while to learn things, but you, you got a great title and it's a great message. And uh, we have to show people how to do it and be very direct and concrete and simple. That was my message to Art Johnson. That's my message to anybody listening to this call. That's what I do. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. That's, uh, uh, I'd like to just touch on, I'm not sure the right word is solutions, but uh, yeah, strategies. That, you know, we had a, an interesting guest a, a couple of months here who, who was trying to put, and I think correctly so, put climate change within the context of overgrowth. Yes. You know, that, that, that we've. The degrowth over, agenda. Yeah. We, we've crowded our, our, our economy, our way of life to such a degree that we're causing collapse. And one of the factors is climate change. So that yep. therefore, when you look at ways to address climate change, we do need to be pretty careful. So for example, although there's benefits to uh, EVs, there's also a whole new stage of extraction that's, that's taking right. place. For the batteries, especially. Yes. So, you know, how, how much of, in terms of hope, how much of our hope is thinking of a whole different way of living versus tinkering with what we have now? And yeah. that seems to be a, a hard step for people to take and also somewhat difficult to explain. It is difficult to explain, and it requires that we get people to think uh, in a different way about how they're actually living. I Just yesterday, I, I met with a, a fellow who I hadn't seen in some time. I'm going to try to see if I can find his card in front of me. Um, I collect cards for pe from people. And, uh, oh, yes, Jerome Kerner. If Jerome ever hears this call this Zoom call, um, maybe I'll bring his attention to it. He told me an interesting thing. He's 88 years old, 88 mm. years old. I looked at him, I, my jaw dropped. I said, you, you don't look a day older than 60. Uh, and he's part of the group called Saging, which I don't know if you've ever heard about that organization. It was created by Reb Zalman Schachter, who was a rabbi who lived in Boulder, Colorado. I knew Reb Zalman personally. And Reb Zalman and I were in a restaurant one time. This is 25, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, Reb Zalman's deceased. Um, but he would love this story because he said, Rick, you know, this, uh, this, this business about uh, aging and all of that, he said, it's really very simple. The question is, are you saved? And I looked at him. And I thought to myself, scratched my head. I said, he's a clergyman as this uh, What's the theological? And he says, no, no, I don't mean it in a, a religious sense. I mean it in a computer sense. Are you saved? Have you done your legacy work? Have you downloaded your life experience for future generations? Mm -hmm. And I realized this is the question I need to be asking, too. He was older than me. Uh, now I've grown a little bit older, so I'm trying to learn that. Anyway, so I, I was talking to my 88-year-old friend. Here's his card right here. And uh, he told me he'd moved from a, uh, a four-acre farm in Westchester County, if you know anything about Westchester County. I used to live in Rockland County on Palisades right near Westchester. And he moved to be near his, his grandchildren, just like me, to the San Francisco Bay Area. And he moved into a into downtown San Francisco, not exactly downtown, but an area. He loves it because uh, he can walk anywhere. Uh, goes walks outside the front door, 
not far to uh, uh, where I can get food. And I realized, wow, I live in exactly the same situation. I didn't realize I was doing it. It's what some people call the 15 minute city, uh, mm -hmm. which is a concept, very interesting concept, controversial, by the way. Uh, that's not a bad thing that it's controversial. Uh, and we're not going to get everybody to live in a 15 year, 15 minute city, but we may enable people to see that proximity to others has value in a way that suburban living may not. And uh, so we have to face some challenges there with elders in the suburbs. And some of those are personal and some of them have to do with climate and relying on cars for everything and all the rest of it. So I think as we think about this, I've just told you a story. It's a, a true story uh, about Jerome Kerner. Here he is. Um, and I didn't even know he'd moved from uh, not far where I used to live, not far from where I used to live in the Hudson Hudson River area uh, to near, near, near me now. Let's get together. We, we will. And that, that is also a, a crucial dimension. Uh, I haven't mentioned it so far, but I want to stress it for climate action. Um, we need to rely on others. We need to be encouraged by other stories. Um, and that's something that has really helped me. I only moved to the Bay Area three years ago, uh, right in the middle of COVID, actually. I didn't know that what was going on. I didn't even I, I turned out I actually had COVID and didn't realize it. And that's a metaphor in itself. We're actually experiencing some of these processes and we don't realize it until, you know, your house is flooded as mine was a month or so ago, um, atmospheric river, whatever you want to call it. That's the core of the problem. Pay attention to what's going on around you, connect with people who are near you and help one another. Uh, that is crucial for people to be working on climate advocacy as, as I spend my life doing. And you do too. Why do you do what you do? I mean, you're connected with each other. This is not the first time you, the three of you have been on this call, I know. Uh, so connect me with what you're doing and keep telling me the story. I love the fact that you're telling me about previous interviews that you've had, previous dialogues. Uh, that makes me wish I'd, tuned into you earlier, but I'll tune in from now on. <laughs> we have had some interesting uh, uh, dialogues and it's interesting to get different, uh, I mean, sometimes significantly different perspectives. That's okay. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I do think that the common thread is that uh, all of our guests have recognized that this is a very serious problem. Yes, it is. It is. You know, some some would be up bumping against what you would call the the, the doomer mentality, and yeah. I, I don't even like using that term, but I mean uh, that that it's almost too late, and others are focusing more on activism, and others are focusing more on education and thinking. So it's been a very I think it's yeah, a beneficial process. Rebecca Solnit, I want to encourage you to uh, get her on this show. I don't know her personally, but she's a close associate of Bill McKibben, and she has written some of the best work on hope. One of her books is titled Hope in the Dark, and um, that's a very important uh, message. Matter of fact, uh, in my next newsletter, you're going to see that I begin uh, with a quote from Wendell Berry, uh, who said, uh, something to the effect, um, hope, even though you know all the facts, follow hope. Mm -hmm. And that's the important dimension. We need to follow the facts. We need to pay attention to the disasters, potential, and some already occurring. But we also need hope. And hope means, and I said earlier, uh, hope is action with its sleeves rolled up. And that means actually getting involved. So I'm sure you've had great uh, stories in your, your programs to date, and I want to publicize them. I want other people to be aware of this, of activism uh, as medicine. Now, that's really what you're selling. The doctors right. agree too, by the way. <laughs> I have a question about the AARP. Okay, good. Because I don't work for them anymore. I'm not I'm sure I'm I'm curious about their politics and their philosophy of um, advocacy, you might say, because the last time I looked at their publications, it looked to me 
like it was pretty weak on action. And it was mostly about the lifestyle of being an, an elderly person. Now, maybe yeah. things have changed in the last few years, but I sensed a real um, lack of engagement and a lack of advocacy in that world. Now, have, have things changed? What, what uh, is AARP doing? Are, are they AAR, AARP was founded in uh, 1958, okay, when I was 13 years old. And um, a, I, I, first of all, I'm biased because uh, I worked for AARP for nearly 10 years in Washington, and it was the best job I ever had in my life. Uh, I didn't seek it out. They sought me out. And uh, I knew the guy who, John Rother, who was the executive vice president, he'd been there for 20, 25 years in charge of policy. Mm -hmm. um, so his main job, and ultimately part of my job, was policy and advocacy. But here's the crucial thing. Uh, ARP has 38 million members. Mm -hmm. The largest aging organization in the world, by far, has 5,000 employees, a billion dollar organization. Uh, do they do advocacy? Yes, they do, but very carefully because a third of their members are Democrats, a third are Republicans, and a third are independents. And no matter what they do, on any position, on any topic, uh, it will require careful calculation. So they don't do things quickly. They do things slowly and carefully. Uh, in 2010, when I was working there, uh, we had a proposal from President Obama for the Affordable Care Act, which eventually became called Obamacare. And people wanted AARP to get involved with it. And so that took up my life for an entire year, just working on the Affordable Care Act, because eventually we brought together actors from business, from labor unions, nonprofit groups all throughout Washington together every couple of weeks for a full year to talk about all the issues, all the problems. Eventually, we decided to endorse it. I say we because I was part of that process. Uh, that law passed by a very slender one vote or something like if AARP had been neutral or had been against it, it never would have passed. Mm. I will say this publicly, although AARP has never said it publicly, but I'm saying it publicly now. It caused the greatest loss of membership and angry resignations in our history. Uh, but AARP knew, knew that we needed to do it because a big chunk of our members are between age 50 and 65, old enough to get sick, old enough to be subject to ageism, but not old enough to qualify for Medicare. All right, that's a problem that we have in terms of lack of universal health coverage. And is was the Affordable Care Act the solution? Uh, no, it's not the total solution, but it was a big step in the right direction. And uh, for me, being a, what you might call a radical incrementalist, uh, I say, take the steps that are possible. Social security was once a, st a step like that in 1935, 10 years before I was born. And um, at that time, the D Democrats who were very powerful in, in the United States Congress made sure that the law was constructed in such a way that blacks would not be eligible. These were Southern Democrats in a time of segregation. And so it, FDR went along with it. Um, and he went along with other aspects because he knew that once in place, it would grow. And that's exactly what happened. Social security grew. Eventually, Medicare was added onto it. The Affordable Care Act is not the final solution to any of these things. And the same is true for the Inflation Reduction Act too, by the way, if we can talk about Joe Biden. Again, I said I didn't want to talk about politics, but you know, uh, I was involved in it, obviously, for AARP. AARP doesn't always advertise all the things that it does in its newsletter, in its magazines, because most of the readers are not all that much interested in politics. Um, they will vote. In fact, the older people vote at a higher level than any other age group. Unfortunately, in 2016, they also voted for Donald Trump at a higher level than any other age group. That has begun to change in 2020, and we hope to make it change further. But um, 
these things are not simple. They're not easy. Uh, but it's not true that AARP does not do advocacy. Mm. Do it carefully. And changing it, by the way, let me just say one other thing. Changing it is not uh, simple either. It's like moving the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth. There's a big ship like this. It's not so easy to do. So I'm working with uh, 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 some people who have developed a petition to push AARP. Uh, these include not just retired staffers like me, but AARP members. Well, you folks on this call, if you haven't signed the petition uh, in my newsletter on Saturday, you'll see a whole announcement about the petition and uh, why you should sign it. Uh, well, you should sign it because at some point, AARP nationally will be involved in this. In fact, AARP just a year or two ago devoted the cover story of the magazine to the subject of climate change. Again, blowback. Lots of people were angry about that. Of course they were angry. So what do you do about it? Well, we figured out what we do here in California. And this is for, for you, John, because you're in Sacramento right now or near Sacramento. Um, we talked to AARP California, which is, of course, the largest state, the largest membership. Um, and we said, we want to uh, push climate issues. Well, they were very careful. They were very cautious. But eventually they said, yeah, we'll, we'll sign on to this. Uh, and we'll frame it in terms of, did you know there's ways to save you money on your household uh, heating costs and electricity and all the rest? So we pitched it. In fact, the guy who organized this said, we won't even use the term climate change. We'll just talk about saving money and tax deductions and things like that mm -hmm. under the IRA. And unfortunately, a lot of people have never heard of the IRA, um, a lot of voters um uh, it's a good thing and it has possibilities but only if people take advantage of those possibilities and that's why once now that we've succeeded here in california we intend to try to replicate the same thing in florida in colorado in new jersey in minnesota these are states that i'm working with them on how to do this because each state this is by the way this is uh, kind of an answer to frank uh, AARP nationally does have certain restrictions that it places on people, but less than people realize. And um, states have the ability within a certain range to take actions, including on things like climate, mm -hmm. climate change. So that's a, a way to move, again, top down, bottom up. We need both. We need both an Inflation Reduction Act and a national AARP, but we also need bottom up action uh, at the state level and at the local level, which is, I already mentioned what I did here in San Mateo, but I'm not unique. People are doing this all over the, all over the country, uh, including, I'm sure, in Oregon, which has been hard hit. Frank, you're, you're in Oregon, right? Uh, yeah. You have your own challenges there. Uh, am I right about that? Uh, I, I don't know, really. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, that's 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 the question of where we where we begin. Begin where start where you are. Pema Chodron, the uh, the Buddhist teacher, she has a great uh, book titled "Begin Where You Are," and that's what I try to do. Nice, nice. JLo, what do you got? Yeah, you know, you've you've got me with this old chestnut, the old "Think globally, but act globally." That's and, it, and, and how that local action can inspire us then to have hope, not not kind of a you know hope with the the sleeves rolled up kind of hope, not the techno optimist hoping that someone else, some deus ex machina is going to solve all this right, for us. Right. It's actually That's about us one. taking personal responsibility to get our butts off the couch and get involved in community with each other and to share those stories that you were talking about. Who right. do you think would be some of the greater motivators for those of us over, let's call it the age of 55 uh, yep. or 60, whatever, to get off our butts and to get out there? What would be the biggest motivators that we could really attract other elderly folks out of their houses and and into the into the actual work of you know rolling the sleeves up and getting our hands dirty. That that's that's the way to go. And uh, when we eventually, hopefully within not too long a period, a few weeks, months, uh, start that YouTube climate action channel, um, that's where we will collaborate with you, with uh, your activism as medicine group and. I would encourage whoever we interview and talk to when we find those stories, we'll share them with you and then you can talk to them. And I'm doing the same actually with uh, Constance Washburn, who uh, 
a theater person who's uh, she developed something called the Passageways to Elderhood Alliance. And she turns out she used to work in environmental causes. That was her main job in life. So um, the deal I made with her literally yesterday in San Francisco was, I'll work with you, you work with us, we'll share things. I started out today by setting up a, a Zoom call between her and my my friend in the state of Washington who does uh, the elder outreach with uh, uh, with YouTube. So again, we need to use the technology, but we also want to remember that personal connection, there's no substitute for personal connection. I'm connected with you guys now on this, on this program that you run. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were not connected at all. Uh, a couple of months from now, I'll be connected with people I've never met. Uh, and you will be too. And that's how change will happen. By the way, that's how the American Revolution happened. If you stop and go back and think about it, yeah. uh, Paul Revere and the Boston Tea Party, all kinds of things like that came from the bottom up. And eventually, you know, big shots like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, then they got involved. So we need we need all those people, both at the big level and the small level. Hmm. Love it. Action creates opportunities. It does. Action creates opportunities. That's exactly how we have to approach it. And, and that's so important for, for older people because it, it's great, you know, that I'm, you know, 79 years old and I can walk around. I don't have a walker and all the rest of that. But um, if you go to, uh, for example, just uh, last weekend, I was with my, my, uh, some relatives and friends house in Sonoma County. And John knows where that is. It's not too far from Sacramento. And um, I was seeing the people in walkers, seeing the people who had trouble getting out of their uh, apartment. It's a senior living facility inspired by Quaker tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, but once they were connected in the library, there was a 97-year-old a, a woman who was a, who was a poet speaking about her life experience. Mm -hmm. And she became alive. And everybody in the audience became alive. That's what's needed. So we'll enable older people to live longer and to live better as they help future generations live better. And then we'll have an answer to Reb Zalman's question uh, to survive, to leave a legacy. Mm. That's really the challenge that Reb Zalman was giving to me, how to survive, how to leave a legacy. He was right. Thank right. you, Reb Zalman. <laughs> John? I'm wondering, thinking in terms of different uh, strategies. Yeah, strategies. That that there's, uh, I keep about. coming back to these, thinking about different ways to approach it. And it, it does seem that uh, many of the mainstream things that, that people have done have not led to the, the change at the speed that it needs to be made. I agree with that. And, and I'm, I'm not saying to abandon all different approaches, but at some point, I, I think there's a strong feeling by many people that we need to engage yep. in civil disobedience. Yeah. Keep it, keep it nonviolent. What do you see as the role for elder people? Okay. In see, the, and that's it's a touchy issue, but I, I think you know, it's talking you're, about. you're getting me up and moving. See, I'm walking into another <laughs> room because I need to get a book for you. And the book is one that I um, very highly recommend. Uh, it, I, I, I love the book so much that I got to know the author personally. And I'm going to hold up the book so you can see it and so all our listeners can see it. And I'll be able to tell be able to tell Lawrence McDonald um, this is the book. Hmm. Excellent. It's and the reason why I'm recommending it is because it, it he has in here an answer uh, to the question that you just raised, and it's in chapter eight. Um, oh no, chapter seven. Should I get arrested? The whys and hows of civil disobedience and more nonviolent direct action, and then the next chapter. Who you call in radical, 
why climate change needs a bigger radical flank and how you can help. And the last chapter, just do it. Okay, I want to encourage you to, and I'll give you the, his contact information. I want him to be interviewed. Uh, he's a guy who is in his, I'd say, late 60s, something like that, uh, a boomer. Uh, and he titles his book, uh, Am I Too Old to Save the Planet? A, Bo a Boomer's Guide to Climate Action. And in that chapter, he talks about his experience uh, of being arrested uh, and how his, you know, anxiety about this with regard to his children and all the rest of that. Um, and this is the kind of message that I think is powerful. And I can't answer the question directly because I've never had that experience. I had had plenty of experience in the 1960s when I was marching against the Vietnam War, uh, but never to the point where I was disobeying the law, getting arrested. But yes, I do think there's a place for it. The challenge is how to do it the right way in a way that actually advances the agenda, uh, which means that it has to be public. Uh, and Bill McKibben, who uh, Bill McKibben and I know each other to, to a degree, we were both panelists together on a, a program about a year ago. Um, but when Bill McKibben was uh, organizing a protest march in Washington, uh, this was um, when Obama was in the White House, um, he, he made a point of uh, getting all the older people. This was long before he, Bill McKibben founded Third Act. This is when he was he developed 350.org and other groups. But he made a point of getting all the old people uh, to get dressed in as good as they could, the, both the women and the men in their best clothing and put them in the front of the line. And they were the ones who would get arrested first, okay? So, and they volunteered for this. So I thought that was a, a wonderful experiment that he did. It wasn't just an experiment. He knew that by doing it that way, uh, he would uh, he would be kind of gr grannies who are going to uh, save the world concept. And there's a whole right. group like this of the uh, grandmothers engaged, and I try to help them however I can. So people are going to take different routes, and and uh, Lawrence McDonald uh, makes that point. He said this is not for everybody. Uh, some people will want to do it. Some people will not. Uh, it wasn't required that everybody get busted in the 1960s during the civil rights uh, experience. Uh, but it was required that if people are going to do it, they're going to have to be trained for it and prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to it's going to require intelligent action, uh, not just, you know, throwing paint at a canvas in a museum or something like this. This may get you uh, publicity. And uh, part of the dilemma that Extinction Rebellion ran into in the United Kingdom is uh, somebody in the group, I don't think it was the leadership, said they wanted to, uh, you know, have a protest and shut down the Washington, the, uh, the London uh, tube. Right. Uh, and uh, it got a lot of people angry, it got a lot of visibility, but... Uh, does that really make sense? Do we do people interested in climate change want to stop public transportation? That strikes me as exactly the opposite of what you want. Um, somebody made a mistake. Okay, thinking intelligently about action uh, is required, and it's not easy. It requires people to share their mistakes as well as their successes, and there have been successes. There have been successes. And Lawrence McDonald will detail those in his book. So I'm sorry for not answering the question uh, in a better no, way. That's a good that's a good answer and it's a good a good source. One of the things that Extinction Rebellion does do uh, meticulously is insist that anyone that engages in civil disobedience be trained. Yeah. They actually yeah. have very formal yeah. training programs as well as uh, actual interventions where in a large action, if someone starts to lose it, or or you know gets gets to the point where they're uh, b bothering someone, then someone will step in and say, "Hey, calm down. Let's try to you know understand that nonviolence involves how you." Think it's interesting you mentioned this because I go every week, uh, every Friday to Fridays for Future, Greta Thunberg's group, mm -hmm. and we have a sort of a branch in Palo Alto, not far mm -hmm. from. Live, and so every Friday I'm there in the public square, 
meeting others, connecting with others, trying to get our message across. And so we decided that uh, since we're called Fridays for Future, the first Friday, and we started doing it on Groundhog Day, uh, February 2nd, uh, we would go dressed up in costumes. Um, everybody had the same costume and nobody was supposed to say anything, all silent, except the leader. And he would give out, you know, cards or whatever it'd be. Uh, all except me. I was dressed up as the Grim Reaper. Uh, and if if we, uh, if we were able to do that, I'd go into my closet and get the uh, my costume. It's all black and all so forth. Well, here's an interesting thing that happened with that. We, we did that a couple of different times, all silently, and in such a way that we made sure not to disrupt traffic. We marched all around the city, got a lot of positive reaction in the, the Apple store and other kind of places like that. But at least one person, maybe more, were deeply distressed by seeing me, the Grim Reaper, because they'd undergone a bereavement experience recently. And for them, this was distressing. So here's the question. I don't have an answer to this question, by the way. Um, uh, did I make a mistake in presenting uh, this uh, grim portrait? By some estimates, 4 million people have died since the year 2000 because of climate disaster in one way or another. Do we not talk about that? Do we not show it? We not say things that are distressing to people. Okay. My answer is I think sometimes we have to distress people. Sometimes we have to disrupt people. And uh, what I did was pretty trivial from a certain point of view. Uh, and the question of how do we do demonstrations in ways that don't harm people and that don't disrupt life, particularly disrupt public transportation, if that's our goal. These are questions that I think we need to ask, and we're asking those questions, and other people are asking them too. There'll be more questions like this in the future. So I'm really happy, John, that you're having this training because that's exactly what we need. Yeah, I think that when you look at the, the way to answer the type of question you raised about dressing up as the, the Grim Reaper is to also have perhaps a, a larger focus in the sense of what is the purpose of, of your or you know your specific organization? That's right. One of the reasons that I, I like the Extinction Rebellion movement is because they focus on the truth. Mm -hmm. The and truth. Yeah. Unfortunately, the truth is, you know, it's it's not we're not talking about polar bears anymore. Human beings are are, we're are not talking subject. about polar bears. Yeah. I mean, and so we've we've made this despite problems that may have arisen, Extinction Rebellion has to me change the whole, uh, as Frank would talk about, the the window. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the window of discourse now has has switched over there. And without having uh, uh, the Grin Re Reaper, that discourse may not take place. Well, that's what uh, McDonald talks about when he says that chapter, uh, uh, who you call a radical, why, the, why climate needs a bigger radical flank. Right. And how you can help. I, I, he right. says it better than me. And I've gotten to know Lawrence and you, you'll enjoy talking to him. I guarantee it. Yeah. But I mean, I also agree that you can get carried away. Sometimes the it seems that the focus of many actions now is based on the theory that the most the more people who see it and react, the more positive it is. So therefore, it doesn't yeah. really matter so much what we do. And I think I think that's a mistake. I mean, Martin I think, Luther you know, King or Gandhi, would, the, 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 the genuine agents of social change. I mentioned King or Gandhi. Right. They would not agree that the more pe people you who see it, the better. That's right. publicity from for Hollywood. There's no such thing as bad publicity. That's that's Donald Trump's view. Uh, yeah, he gets some mileage out of that. But I I hope in the long run people are going to turn away from it. Well, the, the, again, it doesn't matter if they see it, which you, you don't really want them necessarily just to see it. You want them to see it and then change. And mm -hmm. you want them to mm -hmm. see it and change. That's and right. so, you know, if, if you're, uh, you know, taking an action where people are offended, they may become a more aware of the issue, but that doesn't mean they're going to do anything about it. Yeah. Where if you do it carefully, I mean, there's some very clever things that can be done and, and have been done that are 
I want you to share with me some some more stories and experience from Extinction Rebellion, and I'd like to publicize that. I I, I of course profile that in my book, uh, but I I didn't do it in enough depth and detail. So I like what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that they do is 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 they in the early days at least they make fun of people in the sense that one of their first actions in London, they have about eight or ten people dressed up like a giant crab. <laughs> and then and then went down the street and headed to Parliament, where yeah. they were promptly uh, arrested by you know people in heavy duty security clothing, and uh, and you know the, the the headlines were you know XR uh, crab gets kettled. I guess that's what you you say in <laughs> Great Britain when you throw the the crab in the hot. yeah yeah. I mean, that's just, people couldn't help but laugh about that. It's, that's right. It's you see, you're pointing out the importance of humor. And that's the reason why I always put cartoons in my... Uh, right. I noticed that. Uh, yeah. And I'm always looking for jokes and, and com comedy th things. Not because this is a, a, a you know, a, a comic situation. It's not. But, you know, psychoanalysts understand that humor is one way of coping with anxiety. And sure. We need to pay more attention to that. I love the I love your example of the of the crab. You, uh, you, you get people uh, people relate to you through through laughing. Yeah, in yeah, humor they do. and putting things in perspective. And sometimes when you're dealing with people that are very pompous and arrogant, and, and <laughs> if you if you make fun of them, right, right, that's exactly right. Very effective way to go. Exactly right. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Frank. Yeah, uh, speaking of actions uh, and senior citizens, there was an action, and this may have been a year ago, thereabouts, and it might have been part of Third Act, I'm not sure, but the idea was to challenge the banks by having a lot of seniors show up with rocking chairs, and they yeah. sat in the rocking chairs, and I remember looking at the pictures of that and thinking, this is, this is, this is not the the imagery that we want to use because it's it's so it carries this idea of impotence and weakness and leisure. The rocking chair sitting in the rocking chair and maybe some people were persuaded, but I I think we need more more active forms of imagination here and for older people to really take charge of the situation. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And one of the things that Third Act is doing right now, and I, I should acknowledge that I'm part of Third Act and I work very closely with Third Act, of course. Uh, but they, they're, and you'll see actually in my next newsletter, um, uh, they have a whole program called Senior to Senior, in which they get seniors who mobilize high school seniors, old people mobilizing high school seniors to make sure that they're registered to vote and that they actually show up that kind of thing. So I think that uh, we have to translate, always translate demonstrations. And again, the civil rights experience showed how to do this. It has to be connected with policy and politics and mm -hmm. action and collective action, not just individual action or individual protest. It's, it's not easy to do. I should tell you this, because one of the things the Third Act has tried to do is uh, banking and focusing on the big, big bad banks. And of course, there are four of the big bad ones, and I'm well aware of them because I used to work at one point in my checkered career for Citicorp, believe it or not, in New York City. <laughs> I come out of a banking family by background. So I'm very familiar with this, but to make it work in practice, it means people need to get into the details of what do you do with your credit card? How do you transfer the money? Uh, and the same is true, by the way, for uh, things like uh, the heat pumps and so forth with re rewiring your house. Um, that's something that uh, AARP California has learned. Uh, they promoted quite successfully, actually, with you know hundreds of people showing up for these consumer events. But then the next step is, OK, if I want to do it, how do I do it? How do I find the right vendor? Uh, that that's not simple. That that that, and that's always local too. By the way, so I want to mention go back to that bank thing for a minute because yeah, I, I was I wasn't involved in this, but I I followed through a lawyer that I know in 
Washington, D.C., a bank action in Maryland, yeah. where they were all seniors and they all showed up in rocking chairs, but they also all got arrested. Mm. And and the other thing that they did is that, which was effective, is that they all wore a, you know, one of those, you ever seen uh, when seniors are being herded around on a bus tour, they've all got these goofy little uh, name tags and things like this. Yeah. What they did is they took that name tag and they then listed all of their diseases so that when the sheriff arrested them, they had to be aware that as soon as they got to the jail, there had to be medical screening. Mm -hmm. And they created an incredible chaotic, closed the bank for a week. People were out, not for a week, for a day. They were outside, a uh, 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 big crowd got there. And then what they did is they went to trial using the necessity defense. And so then that got media over a period of several months. They eventually lost. And they eventually, I, I don't think it served time or what, and they were probably minimal, but they, they ended up losing the legal argument. But I think it can be done effective if you push it the right way. I, I want to encourage you and, and your activism group to see if you can't put together some kind of uh, optional voluntary uh, Zoom event of people from different climate action areas to talk about the subject that you just raised and to say, what do we know that works? What do we know that doesn't work? What can we learn from the last five years, 10 years of people doing this, whether it's in the UK or America? And again, there are going to be differences from one country. Sure. To yeah. I'd like to see you do that. And I'd be uh, delighted to participate in it. Not that I'm any expert on it, but I'm I'm very interested in marketing and advertising. I actually we used to be on the advisory board of the of the Advertising Council of the United States, the people who brought you Smokey the Bear and United Negro College Fund and things like that. So I've been involved in a lot of strange things in my life. And we need to talk about this and talk about it honestly. And this is an honest conversation that we're having here today. Uh, nobody is, has, uh, we're not selling anything. We're not pushing anything. We're not fighting each other. And uh, we need to, I think you can get together. If you get five people, 10, 50, however many. I, I did a, a Zoom event like this recently for 200 people for Yale. Uh, I, I'm a Yale graduate. So uh, uh, I help them with kind of education for different Yale classes. Mm. You can do this with a lot of people if you do it right. I'll work with you if you want to. I'd like to see it happen. So we're getting pretty close to our, our wrap yes. time. Uh, Rick, what, I guess maybe one of our final questions or one of our final questions is what's next for you? Yeah. What do you plan to be focusing on in the next few months? What's next for me is doing a good job of connecting the young and the old so that the young learn from what us elders have learned, whether it's fundraising or political action or whoever it may be. Uh, and at the same time, we're nurtured by them and their hope for the future. Mm -hmm. That's my big agenda for the, the time to come. And also being a professional grandfather, that's I'm just going to add the agenda here. That's why I'm here in San Mateo. Frank, any last uh, questions? Well, I'm just wondering about the effectiveness of celebrity seniors. So we've got uh, Jane Fonda, who's yeah. out there doing it. Jane Goodall is out there doing yes. it and getting a lot of respect. And Harrison Ford is speaking out a lot on behalf of the natural world. And are these people having an impact? I, I think maybe they I are. Think they are. I, think they, I think they are. As it happens, just by coincidence, I've 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 personally met two of the three that you mentioned. Oh, Jane, good. Where I, Jane Fonda and I were on a program together a few years ago. And by the way, in person, she's a very nice person, a very down to earth, accessible human being. Jane Goodall is a true powerhouse. And I had the great good fortune to introduce her to an AARP national meeting with thousands of people. And so I was able to meet with her a little bit backstage and get to know her. And we need to profile people like this because that not just re uh, commands attention, but it gives people examples of, wow, we can do it. We can make the world better. Um, 
So I, I'm all in favor of that side of, sort of thing. And maybe someday I'll meet Harrison Ford too, <laughs> I hope so. Nice. Hello? Yeah, Rick, if you, uh, you know, knowing that the boomers, we boomers have the time, yeah. the treasure, the talent, the connections, the network, the experience, what yeah. would you say to all of the, the older folks so like us listening to this video, what would be your call to action to them? To understand that, it, that uh, again, McDonald's book, it's not too late. Don't delay because you think something good will happen in the future, a new technology will come in. No, no. Now is the time. Here, now, you, hope. Hope means action. That's what I'd say to them. Don't delay. Right. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this video as much as we did. For more information about Rick, check out activismismedicine.net. We have a Rick Moody webpage. Thanks again for watching.